Through the years, there have been a rare breed of uh, innovative Americans in aviation that just seem to see what others don't see, all right? And I say rare because not only can they see what others don't see, but they can pursue this insight and create something that lasts uh, even to this day. Uh, a lot of people have creative ideas, but uh, the rare ones uh, can actually build something into fruition uh, from those ideas. Uh, these are great Americans in my mind, and they exemplify what opportunity is in our country. Uh, one of those great Americans, Jake Bryant. Uh, Jake was born in Oklahoma in 1919, and in 1951 he moved from Seattle to Anchorage. Uh, Jake, having that rare American quality, uh, started Alaska Float Plane Services, which was one of the first air taxi operations off of Lake Hood there in uh, Anchorage. Jake sold that business and started uh, Jake's Aircraft Salvage, which is still in operation to this day. But one of the things that Jake did that, that is still just amazing to me uh, is the airplane that he created, which he called the Producer. Uh, I say amazing, it's actually amazing on several different levels. Uh, number one, visualizing an airplane from the geometry of several different airplanes, okay? Uh, and number two, getting the airplane built based on what he envisioned. And number three, and this is probably the most amazing part, is after getting the airplane all built uh, based on cutting and pasting all this geometry that he had in his head, he got the whole thing approved through the FAA. So what is a producer? It's an amazing airplane that flies anywhere a cub would go, uh, but yet you don't have the constraints of the uh, lack of space that you do in a cub. Um, so how did Jake uh, do this? Well, he started with a, uh, a Pacer fuselage, uh, which is uh, an airplane much like this project I have. This is a Tri-Pacer. Uh, and then he stretched the uh, aft part of the fuselage to about the same length uh, as a Super Cub, give or take. Uh, and then he added full length PA-14 wings uh, to the airplane. Now a lot of people to this day uh, still wouldn't know what a PA-14 is, but here's part of the genius that Jake had. Uh, you know, he had an understanding of, of, of all the Piper series and knew exactly how to cut and paste to get the airplane that he wanted. Uh, first of all, the PA-14 had the highest gross weight of the uh, Cub type airplanes uh, from, from Piper at that, at that time. The uh, PA-14 had a higher gross than both the uh, PA-12 and the, the PA-18. Plus the Pacer, Tri-Pacer series are all set up to be internally cabled wings. Uh, whereas the Cub has uh, cables running up the back of the struts. Well, the PA-14 wings are internally cabled. Now to top it all off, the PA-14 was uh, the only one of the Cruiser series uh, of Pipers uh, to have flaps. So essentially, out of all that, uh, out of all the long wing Pipers that, uh, uh, that Jake could have taken the wings from, uh, the PA-14 wings were the only ones really that would uh, put that last piece of the puzzle in and Jake knew this. And remember, these uh, airplanes were still relatively new at that time. Uh, Jake's first producer flew in 1959. These airplanes are, are genius for flying in the back, back country. Uh, they essentially have the same wing geometry as a, as a Super Cub. Uh, same engine, same tail, uh, they perform exactly like a Super Cub, but the cargo area is cavernous in one of these airplanes. Uh, plus, here's the big benefit, all right? Uh, when you're operating a producer, uh, in addition to it performing just like a Cub, uh, you also have this huge cargo door, essentially. Okay, uh, it, it's bigger, it's easier to put stuff into this airplane than any other airplane in its class. I've referred to the producer many times as a Cub Class Beaver because of what you can get through the doors. Uh, and why does it have such big doors? Well, the Pacer Tri-Pacer series is a four-place airplane. You have the pilot and passenger up front and two more passengers in the rear. Well, if you're operating it like a Super Cub, then you can just fly it as a side-by-side to play Super Cub. And then at that point, uh, the area here where the rear passengers used to sit, as well as the original baggage area, 
This all becomes a cavernous cargo area. Not only that, where the passengers used to get into the rear, this now becomes a huge cargo door. And I, I say they perform like a Super Cub, and you, the proof is in the pudding, all right? Each year in Valdez, Alaska, there is a uh, enough talking, show me what you got, put up or shut up uh, stool competition. Each year at this competition, the stretched pacer style aircraft uh, compete well against the uh, Super Cubs. And everyone knows that the, uh, the Cub style airplanes, the Cub variants of airplanes, the Piper's airfoil, Cub wing, uh, those airplanes are the gold standard for stool, all right? Uh, you know, if you, if, if you want to know which airplanes are the best ones for stool, just look and see which ones win the competition every year. And um, a, a few years back, a producer made a 30-foot landing, all right? And that basically beat uh, the majority of the competitors that year. I remember the first time I saw a producer. Uh, it was in uh, the mid 80s, early to mid 80s uh, in Anchorage. It was one of those summer nights where uh, it was dead calm. I mean, there wasn't enough uh, wind to blow the smoke away from your Cummins. And um, there was this airplane out there flying and, and I was looking at it and I, I really couldn't identify it. Uh, but but man, it was it was it could go slow. That that I that I could see. So I walked over there, and, and plus it looked like there might be something going on because there was this cop next to the runway standing outside his car watching this airplane. So I walked up to the cop, and when I got closer, I could see that he had a radar gun, and uh, what he was doing was clocking this airplane. So after a, a few attempts uh, at ice breaking words. Uh, you know, the cop just went back to, to, to staring at his radar gun and at one point he just kind of uh, grinned and kind of shook his head. And so I asked him, I said, what was the speed? He said, 32. He, he didn't turn around or make eye contact, he just said, 32. And um, now people can make all sorts of claims about airspeed, all right? and. In reality, probably most people don't really know how fast they're going when they get really slow because airspeed indicators and pitot tubes and all that kind of become uh, inaccurate. But, uh, but this is where the rubber meets the road. This was a cop's radar gun, calibrated. I mean, it was 32 in a no wind condition. Um, now recently there have been some pretty radically modified airplanes that can go way down in airspeed. But uh, in the early to mid 80s, uh, this was astonishing to me. Now I had grown up in aviation and thought I could identify most of the airplanes, or at least most of the airplanes on this continent. But I had no idea what this one was. It, it kind of looked like a T-craft, but not exactly. So in shame, I, I asked the cop what kind of airplane it was. And I, I remember this so clearly. He didn't even turn around or make eye contact or any of that. He just kind of uh, gave a sarcastic chuckle and kind of shrugged my question off by saying, producer. And I'm thinking, producer. And so I'm standing there, I'm thinking, you know, that isn't helping, all right? And so I, it still doesn't mean anything to me, at least it didn't at that time. And uh, so I figured, well, you know what? I've humiliated myself beyond recovery at this point. You know, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask the cop the question that he knew I was going to ask, okay? And I said, what's a producer? So the cop, for a moment, got off his uh, lofty perch and took pity on the ignorant uh, traveler and uh, explain what a uh, producer was. Once I understood what the airplane was and how it was created, I thought the airplane was total genius. I mean, I, I think if Piper had thought of it, they would have produced it themselves. So, on that evening, 30 years ago now, um, who was that flying the producer? Steve Bryant, Jake Bryant's son. Uh, Steve had uh, built his own producer and was out uh, putting it through its paces. Um, and you know, this isn't some trailered in, purpose-built 
stole competition only airplane. This is a, it's a, it was a real airplane, all right? The producer is a real airplane. Uh, moments after being clocked at 32 miles an hour, uh, Steve could have uh, loaded up the airplane with uh, building material, uh, equipment for your mining operation, uh, outfitting moose camp, camping gear, whatever, okay? Uh, you know, it, um, and not only did it, did it fly like a cub, uh, but you could actually get stuff into it. You know, Steve has hauled 55 gallon drums in the back of his airplane. Uh, he's put like combing engines as well as other aircraft parts in there. I mean, over the years, he's hauled tons of stuff in there. And the amazing part is, you can put stuff back in here like a drum or an aircraft engine or whatever, and you can still have two seats for, for a pilot and passenger, all right? Uh, something you could never be able to do in a, in a, in a Cub. And who visualized this almost 60 years ago? Jake Bryant. So what's one of the coolest things about all this? Well, uh, you can still get a completely certificated producer built uh, to this day. Steve Bryant uh, still builds producers on order for clients uh, almost 60 years after Jake built the first one. I wish I could have met the man. Uh, but unfortunately, Jake passed away in 1987, uh, much too young, at the age of 67 years old. However, uh, the aircraft salvage business that he started is still worked by his family today, and uh, the airplane that he envisioned uh, so long ago and put into reality uh, is still being built by his family today. Another innovative, great American, Jake Bryant.